Okay, the uh, Camino de Santiago, which means the Way of St. James, is a thousand-year-old pilgrimage route that I did in June, uh, September, sorry. Uh, uh, I started in a small town of France, and 30 days and 500 miles later, ended up at the city of Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain, where legend has it um, St. James, which was one of the uh, apostles of Christ, is buried. Along the way, there are medieval bridges, there are fortresses built by the Knights Templar to protect the pilgrims from bandits, and also to protect the rest of Europe from the Moors. There are incredible monasteries, and there are the opulent hotels for the royalty that did the pilgrimage, but we're not about to stay in a hostel, oh, please. Um, <laughs> and uh, last year, over 180,000 people hiked the Camino. Uh, some do it for religious reasons, some do it uh, you know, just because they want to have fun, they like to hike. Everybody takes advantage of the incredible infrastructure, which has been in place for over a thousand years to welcome travelers. In fact, the very first traveler's books that they have were guides to the Camino. These were the lonely planets of the Middle Ages. Um, I first read about the Camino when I was a kid. I, I read a book about Spain. I said, this is cool. I got to do it someday. So here I am on the first day, trekking across the Pyrenees, uh, Pyrenees with uh, my partner Bob, my friend Rudy, and you'll notice a cyclist. You can do the Camino either on foot, on horseback, or on bike. We saw hundreds of bikers. They all seem to be Italian. I don't know why. Uh, it goes through these ancient medieval villages. Most of them have inhabitants that seem to be in a perpetual state of siesta. But sometimes they're in a state of fiesta, and they're having fun, which is, which is really nice to see. Um, and uh, it was fun for us to be there, too. Uh, the Camino also goes through great cities like uh, Pamplona, Burgos, Lyon. This is the cathedral in Lyon, built in the 1300s. a magnificent building that really elevates the human spirit, makes you, you know, feel great about yourself. Uh, you know, someday, Penn Station, right? <laughs> uh, I can only hope. Um, the, the villages and towns are spaced about uh, 10 kilometers or apart, so you're never very far from a meal or a bed. And uh, most people stay in hostels, they eat at restaurants, so there's no need to carry too much weight. Uh, you just need to carry about 20 pounds and you're done. I think this guy overpacked. <laughs> I'll be paying for it later on. A typical, a typical day, you start in the morning uh, because you've slept in a hostel and when everybody gets up before dawn, you have to get up too. As many of you know, I am not a morning person. Uh, I do not like this, but at the city planning, you learn to adapt. If you don't adapt, you die. So I learned, I learned to really enjoy these sunrises. Uh, so you, you hike for an hour or so, you have breakfast, you continue hiking until you have lunch, and uh, you'll notice we're having lunch, but we're drinking water because we still have another hour or two of hiking ahead of us, unlike the Germans at the next table, who even though they still have all this hiking ahead of them, they're drinking beer. Uh, you learn a lot about different cultures. This is a typical hostel. Um, they're, uh, you know, they're about 10 bucks a night. Um, they're co-ed. Uh, they're clean for the most part, and they all have hot showers. Uh, the worst thing is about the snorers. Uh, I learned to tune out the snorers very quickly, because again, if you don't adapt, you die. <laughs> and, uh, and then you have to do your laundry. Every day, you got to do your laundry by hand, because you've been hiking all day, and you smell, and you, you got to take a shower, feel like a human being again. You do your laundry, and you hope that by the time you need to wear it again, it's dry. Um, but it becomes very therapeutic. It's a, it's a, nice, a nice rhythm to get into. Um, and uh, then after that, it's Miller time. Um, all, all your chores are done, so you have your cervezas, you have your tapas, you have your octopus, uh, the Galician specialty. So this is like the, the time of day when you finally have a smile on your face. You feel very good. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the day, after your first beer, you decide what you want to do, how you want to spend the rest of the afternoon. If you're in a small town like you usually are, there's not much to do except hang out with your fellow hikers and maybe get a foot massage or treat your blisters or, uh, you know, just have fun with all your fellow hikers. It's, it's a very nice way to spend the rest of the afternoon. And then, if you're lucky, somebody has a guitar, and if you're even luckier, somebody has a ukulele. And, uh, <laughs> I think when I took this picture, they were singing uh, Carol King's Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow. Um, there are a lot of romances that bloom on the Camino, and I'm sure a lot of hearts probably get broken on the Camino, too. Um, but what happens on the Camino stays on the Camino. <laughs> and, and then the best part of the afternoon, is, or, or the dinner, or the day, is, is, is dinner. When you're staying at these hostels, you have a communal dinner. And it only costs like 10 or 12 bucks, and it's endless bottles of red wine, 
and uh, the food is pretty good. Um, lots of vegetable soups, lots of meat. It's, it's extremely difficult to be a vegan in Spain. Um, the next morning, you get up and do it all again, and you get into the rhythm, you get into the camaraderie. Here, Bob is pushing Anne from Australia his bike up the hill, and we got this great notion that we could rent bikes too, and we could then like make up for some lost time and get it done quicker. Um, so we decided to do that for two days. Um, but it kind of backfired. Uh, we felt very guilty pedaling past all our friends that were trudging along in the heat. And then we, we thought we left this lady, Christiana, from France behind weeks ago. But then we, we, just, we realized she was always ahead of us. And we didn't know this until we caught up with her on our bikes. And she looks at us on our bikes. She's like, you guys are pathetic. I mean, you, you, have, you need bikes to catch, to catch up with a 75 year old lady? <laughs> and, and so, you know, then there were quieter moments like this, this little, little 12th century. Uh, Romanesque church, and it's being cared for by an order of Benedictine monks from Bavaria, and they invited us to their evening service, and they sung Gregorian chants, so it's a very nice, very peaceful way to spend an evening. Um, and then, you know, before we knew it, it was over. There's the Cathedral of Santiago, wow. and uh, then after the Mass, they have this huge incense thurible, which they swing wildly back and forth, and it's, you know, incense is spewing, and the organ is playing, and the nuns are singing, and it's very, very emotional. And uh, it's kind of like a fitting end, um, but um, not quite, because you have the option of continuing on to Finisterre on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is kind of a mystical place, because for many hundreds of years it was literally considered the ends of the earth. And so we, we drove out there, because we were tired of the hiking. Uh, it was mystical, and it was very windy, uh, and it was a lot of fun, and it was a fitting end to our journey across Spain. Thank you.